Hello and welcome to Whiskey and Cynicism. This is, of course, Desert Island Drums. I'm Simon Smith. Uh, with me today is, uh, is actually someone who is kind of a fellow blogger uh, in Charlie Houston Sykes. She has a website called uh, Gin Fuel Blue Stocking. Um, uh, when I say a fellow blogger, that's me being a little bit presumptuous because I've been doing this for about five minutes and Charlie's been doing it for a very long time. Uh, Charlie and I met on a brand trip many, many years ago. Um, and uh, it's just uh, going to be very nice to catch up with her first and foremost. But uh, firstly, Charlie, welcome along. And uh, what are you drinking there? Thank you. Um, I'm actually drinking a chocolate Negroni from 58 Gin. It's one of their batch cocktails that they sold ages and ages ago and I bought it and stashed it away. And then whilst I was hunting for a couple of um, drums to play with tonight, I found it and I thought, oh, well, why not? It's sitting there waiting for me. <laughs> Very nice, and it's it's not going to drink itself. Um, so your your blog site, I mean, it definitely differs from mine slightly in that it's well, it's mainly professional, but also, I mean, your 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 blog site is um, is very much, you know, it's a lifestyle blog. You know, looking past the last few posts, there's some product reviews, some uh, bar stuff, as a, a laundry review, some stuff about lifting, and, and you know, so it includes a lot of your passions and and all that. And also, on, on top of that, you have a job completely out with the industry. So a very kind of linear and small part of what you do is blog for the drinks industry um, and primarily for gin, hence the name, but not entirely. What do you think, as far as the drinks industry is concerned, bloggers bring to, to that industry and what is it, why are bloggers of value to the drinks industry? There's kind of two elements to this. So number one, I mean, it's effectively, we are kind of, I mean, I, I appreciate that I've been doing it for like eight years and so and I've been doing brand trips and stuff like that. So I'm kind of one foot in the industry and one foot out but mostly we are sort of the general public and so we can put out our views into the ether whether we're big bloggers or small bloggers or whatever we can put our views out into the ether and it gives brands an idea of what the general public will think of whatever it is that they've created um, the other thing is that we can work with brands in that we can help promote them um, and that's not just necessarily to people who um, you'd automatically want to hit. So if you hit a drinks blogger, if you hit somebody who specialises in booze, then you're going to get people who read specifically about booze and want to know the reviews. But you can also go to other types of blogger, if you like, so beauty, fashion and lifestyle, who have a broader breadth of, of uh, readers. And actually, you can then get out to more people and two different people because if you've got a beauty blogger who has um let's say five thousand followers a proportion of those followers although they're following that beauty blogger for beauty if they happen to see that that beauty blogger's drinking champagne or something they'll kind of want to reach for that aesthetic as well they'll want to emulate the person that they trust and it's that sort of give and take i always find it interesting when um i'm seen as a lifestyle or when other people are seen as the people like to pigeonhole us they like to put us in one bracket but actually our reach can be really varied and different i have lifters who follow me um who will actually drop me a message and say Annie, i'm fancying some rum if i'm one of them i remember in particular beginning of lockdown he was kind of really feeling the pressure he was like i need a drink my favorite drink is rum what do you recommend and i was like right what do you like give me a clue and i sent him off with sort of three or four ideas then eventually had a message from his missus basically saying well he emptied those in about three days so that went well <laughs> <laughs> but we have such a broad reach we have a different viewpoint we're not coming at it from a necessarily industry perspective and i think that's kind of it's important for brands to get that sort of feedback I think that's a huge point is that, I mean, people in the industry, bartenders and, and marketing and all that can assume that people are drinks people or not drinks people. And, and that, that you know, there's no crossover with everything else. So, I mean, absolutely, especially when you, you know, I talk to bartenders about almost anything but drinks these days, music, you know, literature, films, whatever. Ignoring that crossover feels inherently silly to miss, as you say, what could be huge swathes of audience for you yeah and some really do that they just miss the point completely um and i will sometimes get dismissed because i'm quote unquote lifestyle um 
and I kind of have to put this point across and say, no, actually, you're missing a trick. You're missing the point, and you need to be. You need to think away from pigeonholing and and outside that because there's actually loads of areas to explore. Absolutely, um, and I think you know we would obviously gin fuel for blue stocking. We talked about you know the drink side of things there. I mean, for me, people pigeonhole me in whiskey a lot of the time, assuming it's all I like. Um, and really, it's just it's simply a geographical and, and cultural relevance more than anything. If if I lived in Barbados, this would probably be called rum and cynicism. And sometimes I do wonder why not. But, you know, for you, I mean, what, what brought you towards gin specifically? As, as you just mentioned rum already, so obviously it's not your, your entire focus. But what, what, what about gin as a category kind of do you, do you enjoy immersing yourself in? So to sound really hipster, I was, I was into gin long before it was trendy. I um, had my first G&Ts when, I mean, ignoring this, that going around my, uh, it was my brother's christening, I was probably about six or seven and I went around and finished everybody's drinks. Ignoring that, um, I, my first proper G&T was when I was about 15 and I worked in a, um, it was an industrial door company, tiny little company, there were uh, four of us, the two bosses upstairs, the office manager and me. And I was, I was like a, um, an apprentice, if you like. It was youth training. This was like 90s, showing my age. Um, and I, every, once a month, the guys would come down from upstairs and they'd say, right, we're going to the pub. And before we could have what we wanted to drink, and for Andy, the office manager, that was he wanted a Michelob. And I wanted something like a Bacardi and Coke or a hooch or, you know, I mean, this was the, the era of, of alcohol. So I wanted one of those. We had to have a G&T. It, became, it was like a tradition. We had a G&T. These were like the blazer and striped tie brigade. So we had to have a G&T before we could have anything else. And it became that because we had that once a month, and I was with them for like 18 months. I really just got a taste for gin. Fast forward to, um, I think I started blogging in 2012. Fast forward to then, and I went to a uh, gin tasting with um, a drinks enthusiast. And by that point, I had done a couple of blogs. One involved wine, one involved fitness, you know, so I was kind of finding my feet. And I wrote something about gin. And I, you know, when you just have that moment of, why don't I just keep going with this? I should just keep doing this because I love gin and I've been drinking it since I was 15 and I should just, let's just write about gin. And this was before it got stupidly big. This was long before. So it's, it's not, not as long as say, um, Ollie from, um, Oh God, I've forgotten his website name. Uh, but Ollie's been doing gin since way before I have, he was like 2007. He's been doing it for donkeys. Um, but for me, it was just a case of, I like it. I learned a lot from Dave about it. I then did more research and learned more. And it was just because I had a growing gin collection because I was enjoying it. Um, and it was the same time, it was after Sip Smith had had their sort of moment of creating craft gin, if you like. It just became a, oh, I can easily review this. And that's a nice blog post. It's, it's I kind of originally thought of it almost if you like as blog fodder. It's, you know, it's something I can do. It's something I can put out there whilst I'm not at an event or I'm not at a restaurant or whatever. It's something I can do and it's easy. I mean, it's not easy. You have to learn how to taste it and what have you, but it was something that I could put out there. I dread to think, I dread to go back and read some of the old reviews I did. <laughs> some of them, I think, I'd, yeah, I'd, I'd go back and read the notes and think, good God, woman, what on earth were you talking about? But it's kind of where things started. And although I've gone off and done all sorts of weird and wonderful things, including the grand trip that we went on, gin has always been there. Yeah. It's always been something that I can go back to. It's funny you say that. When I went to set up this current website, I went to try and pill for a lot of old material just to launch it with some, some kind of formats and content on it. And one of, the, one of the blogs I found, a lot of them I edited, and one I found that I actually had to write a new blog slagging that one because it was so bad. <laughs> <laughs> um, but I think that's interesting about gin as well because I mean, people kind of dismiss gin in a, lot, in a lot of different ways, especially kind of sipping drink aged or aged syrup, spirit uh, drinkers. Mm -hmm. You know, where, where I might, especially with whiskey, think of a certain person and have a certain dram with them. 
stuff like you know gin i mean i make there's some person i meet for gin and tonic and, and someone will ask us you know what would you like can it be have you got gordon's or have you got something cheaper then other people do want to talk about it in a kind of more elaborate way about different and, and new skews there's some people who want to see them you don't even have to think you just order two martinis in the same way that other people i'd order an hour and ten or whatever so it, it does it does have that place in the world i think i probably consume more gin than i do whiskey anyway it's kind of in some ways although whiskey is amazing and i always say gin is my first love whiskey is my second um it's sort of it's all encompassing you've got the light easy stuff that you can just neck and almost like a session beer you you barely notice it but you enjoy it but it's not there for picking out particular flavors or whatever it's it's just an easy drink to drink because you you know chuck a load of tonic and it ice and the slice sorted there's others that are much more complex and complicated that actually you wouldn't dream of putting anything in almost the same with whiskey i mean there's some that um on the um maybe even on the blended side where you would think nothing of chucking ginger in it you yeah, think absolutely. nothing of lengthening it um you'd probably still enjoy it on its own but actually you'd think nothing of just whacking it together and and making something longer out of it but there's others that you wouldn't dream of messing with and you'd yeah. you know you'd enjoy them as they are for what they are yeah, I mean, obviously these days kind of highballs and that kind of thing are becoming hugely popular. And we are trying to break down barriers, I guess, in mixing with whiskey. But also there's the upshot of it is that some stuff, you know, I mean, it's all personal preference. But yeah, there's definitely things that I just don't find need it. But there's other, I mean, there's, there's some very expensive stuff that I think that's going to be delicious with soda. And it yeah. doesn't matter that it's expensive, it's still fucking delicious with soda. I mean, I think that's where people confuse whiskey as well. People think expensive things shouldn't be fucked with but really the, the situation is that you can have an everyday drinker at 350 quid a bottle if that bottle's available every day it's an everyday drinker and you can have an exceptionally rare thing that you should probably savor at 50 quid because maybe only 200 bottles are made and it's delicious so i think sometimes that we can get that wrong and i think it's probably the same in, in gin to be honest um you know perceived value and and kind of how you should treat it are sometimes a bit different i'd say yeah, no, I totally agree. And there's some um, both in in all both whiskey and gin, and probably all other um, booze boozes as well, that are ridiculously expensive, and you still wouldn't buy. <laughs> <laughs> there is, yeah. you know, there are some where it's just a place that you can take something that's relatively cheap, and you don't mind, for example, chucking it in a punch where you're not really going to taste a lot of it, and it's fine. But you're not going to do that with a stupidly expensive one that's not that good. Yeah, exactly. I mean, you could if you want, but it wouldn't make a difference. I think that's that's half the problem as well. It won't make a fucking difference. Um, well, well, we might have kind of almost come near something there, but um, the next question that I do ask everyone is, um, what annoys you most about the drinks industry? Which I guess you're not, as you say, you're one foot in and out of it, so you might have more of a, a detached view than some of some other people like me who kind of get really riled up about shit because we're in it all the time. But for you, what annoys you most about the drinks industry? There's a few. There are still those who believe in gendered drinks. And that's a personal absolute bugbear of mine. I have been, um, both for myself and one of my closest friends, we both have husbands who have very sweet teeth and they love sweet stuff. I mean, my friend's husband in particular, give him bubblegum pink with all the fruit in it. And he is the happiest boy in the world. This is a guy who goes ice climbing. So he's a big butch fella, but he loves bubblegum martinis. <laughs> and my other half's one for kind of sweet rum drinks. But myself and her are very much um, short, heavy. We like martinis. We love um, uh, things like uh, Death in the Afternoon. We like Sazeracs and, you know, proper heavy stuff. But you can bet your bottom dollar at some point we will go into a venue with our other halves and order something and they'll put the wrong drink, drink in front of us. They won't ask. They won't query it. They'll just put it down and it's wrong and it just winds me up because, no, that's... No, it's, you know, I don't taste... Um, to put it quite crudely, I don't taste my drink with my genitals. I used to, but I got kicked out of a lot of places. <laughs> <laughs> to be fair, men do have taste buds in their testicles. I said it's a nightmare, trust me. 
um but it, it's just pointless and um, i've also had it happen when i've gone to a restaurant with my husband and we've had food he's ordered the fish and i've ordered the steak and they yeah. put the fish in front of me and the steak in front of him and it's like all you have to do is ask clarify it nobody's yeah. gonna look like an idiot um the other one they kind of overlap i guess is there is a lot of snobbery huge amount of snobbery now i'm very much for one if you if you like it and that's how you like to drink it. if you want to put coke in a 21 year old bushmills i might wince but do it if that makes you happy you know it's you drink it how you like it by that same token however i am aware that there are areas in particularly in gin where people are not open and honest about stuff so things like um gin liqueurs being labeled as gin and they're two very different things and the uh, the great british public often don't have a clue what the difference is and then you also have the spirit drinks which might be even a step below that in abv sort of like five to ten percent because it's then again diluted gin right the way down um and it's it's still put under the label in some way it's sometimes on a bar menu or when it's being sold in a market or something like that it'll just be classed as gin and it's not um by the same token there are some companies who will call it gin and it has never seen a juniper berry in its life um and also those who use a lot of additives and don't sort of they're not open and honest about it i know it happens in rum with colorings and things like that and there are times when i can understand it it being used that's fine but don't lie about it because that's not fair and if that's what, if any of those are what you want to drink that's fine i just want the brands to be open with you and not lie to you about it or not hide anything or just not you know that lie by omission yeah, I think that's absolutely because I mean, it's one of those things with the whiskey it tends to happen less in Scotch whiskey because of the SWA, which is very, very good at protecting the brand of Scotch. But often it's talked about how that kind of hamstrings producers as well in terms of creativity. So it's a bit of a two edged sword sometimes. But with the likes of gin and rum, two very good examples, they are such wide categories with made, made, made in so many places that it's very difficult. So what really needs to happen is for almost re like kind of regional uh, appellations to come into effect a bit like scotch whiskey to even get some measure of control because the, the word gin i don't think is ever going to be inherent quality like scotch kind of is it needs to become regional um, and of course the irony is that we would have seen very shortly with the EU regulations changing we would have seen alcohol being needed to be branded with ingredients in the same way that um, food is except of course we are taking back control um, so we will not see that particular regulation and I, I, unfortunately I don't think we'll see it at all because it's, it's not in a lot of people's interests but you're right drink what the fuck you want and I put whatever you want in it if it's part of your category and you can do it fine but it's yeah the, the misleading the public into thinking that one is the same as the other because it says the same words when it's very different yeah. is, is, is it time to travesty for those of us who are enthusiastic about the, the better things in that category yeah it's, it's genuinely frustrating and I spend a lot of time when I do reviews because I review gin liqueurs and I review gins. There is nothing wrong with a gin liqueur. Absolutely nothing wrong with it. What I get annoyed with is um, I am aware of a um, gin distillery who will put on the label that it's XYZ gin distillery and then underneath that it's a liqueur. And everybody will make that assumption that it's a gin liqueur. And it's not. And it's, it's those subtle tricks wind me up yeah um, it's just so frustrating or getting a gin liqueur and tasting it and i cannot taste the juniper you know it must have one quarter of a juniper berry in the entire bottle because i really can't taste it and i'm used to tasting you know flavors that's i can drink a gin and tell you if it's been done in a copper still that's how much gin i've been drinking um but if, so if I can't taste it at all, if there's nothing there, then I'm going to be a bit pissed. <laughs> Understandably so. And I'd say when it, is a, when it is a passion to see it, the, the, the overall brand of a category kind of diluted like that, 
it's very frustrating. I mean, it happened, so it doesn't happen as much in Scotch because of the SWA, but it happens in a lot of things we look at. But to make it a little bit more positive, I mean, you know, as you say, you've been doing a, lit- a lot of brand trips and you've worked with brands a lot. I'm sure you've had a lot of phenomenal experiences. I mean, and, and one of my personal ones would be the trip we made on the trip to Benedictine, the Fay Comte in Paris, which is a phenomenal experience. But of, of all of them, what would you say is your favorite uh, drinks related memory or, or memory that the drinks industry took you to? Oh, there's so many. I've been absolutely spoiled. I mean, Benedictine was fantastic. And I don't think I've ever wandered around a Normandy castle at any point previous to that or since. Um, and as you remember, the food was amazing. The drinks were amazing. Um, I've also been to kind of some smaller um, trips that I've done kind of independently. So Cooper King Distillery over in York. They have a whiskey still that's a Tasmanian whiskey still, and it's one of the prettiest stills mm. I've ever seen. And it's just beautiful, but it sticks in my head because it's just, I mean, I, I kind of refer to it as still porn. I love a good still, and you know, I kind of want to go over and stroke it and cuddle it and get to know it a bit better. Um, uh, Karoon was another one that was oh, amazing. I mean, there's nothing like going around the Highlands of Scotland in January. You know, when the deer have got their white coats on and it's it's knee deep in snow and you're kind of crammed into a Land Rover um, and then going around and seeing their still, which is based on a perfume still. Um, and then sampling that at 97 percent. You don't do that every day either. Well, you wouldn't. <laughs> yeah, you'd be, yeah, you'd be, you'd be, <laughs> no. You'd be <laughs> no, you would, wouldn't wouldn't recommend it generally. You don't really taste it. You inhale it. It literally hits your tongue and, and evaporates. It's bizarre. Um, I'm trying to think what else. I've just been to some amazing places and I had loads planned for this year. I was actually planning to go to a few cideries this year because um, I've really gotten into cider, which was unexpected. And I had plans to go and visit Welsh Mountain Cider and go down to Ross and Wye Cider, who've done one which is aged in a um, Isla whiskey cask which is amazing um, and I had all these plans and then this has happened and none of that's happened. And the play got in the way. It's funny you talk about still porn there and things. I mean, working within the, or alongside the industry is quite funny because everyone says to you, oh, it must be the, you know, this is the best job in the world. You just kind of, you know, just drink really good drinks for a living and kind of party all the time. And you're like, no, I just really like copper stills. <laughs> just the last thing anyone would actually expect you to enjoy of this part of the, the industry. Um, but I mean, I guess we've mentioned a few of there, but let's, uh, let's go on to the crux of the matter here. If you were taken to a desert island, which I guess during this current plague is, is a, a fairly, you know, enticing idea really. But if you were to end up on a desert island with only three bottles of whiskey, now they are magically refillable, so you will have them for all time, but only three of them. Um, and it doesn't have to be whiskey, but people tend to go for whiskey because it's kind of effective. What would be your three desert island drams? Now, I went for whiskey simply for the fact that, number one, it wouldn't necessarily be expected of me. Um, And number two, trying to narrow down gin is really, really hard. And even even with whiskey, it's really difficult. And I would say that this is how I feel right now. Give me a couple of days and I'll change my mind. That's understandable. Yeah, Yeah, I've been back and forth yeah exactly what side of the bed did i get off on what mood am i in how am i drinking them what's the weather like you know all these myriad of things but i try to be kind of practical about it so first of all i went for one that's really savory kind of meaty and i absolutely love it um is balcony's brimstone very nice yeah yeah so that's a curveball but good. yeah i love what the balcony's guys do it's just oh it's like drinking a barbecue and it's just that i i don't particularly have a sweet tooth mine is much more savory but for me it's that kind of um this is how much i have left of it because i i yeah i go through it and i it goes um but it's it's that proper chewy meaty savory flavor it's my one if i'm going to go for a whiskey before i you know if i've been out and i've been drinking beer or whatever and i want one whiskey before i go home and i spy it on a back bar that's what i'm going to have before i go home because it completely ruins your palate for anything else for a start 
but it is that whole meaty savory thing it's almost like eating it just satisfies nice so the second one I came up with is one that I've not had I had fairly recently in fact both the, the second two I've had fairly recently and it was from Hinch Distillery and it's their 10 year old it's a nice light easy drinking could drink tons of it probably would drink tons of it um i had it in a tasting their gin's very good as well um i had it in a tasting on um online with the whiskey wire and was really surprised that, that they kind of play around really with what they do with it um and i love that but that as a base is fantastic and the final one that I picked um, was another one that I did with the Whiskey Wire, actually. And it's not one you come across all the time. And it's a 50-year-old Fata Can. And it's coconut and pineapple and really floral and totally unexpected. And I've never really come across coconut and pineapple in a whiskey. And it completely blew my little mind. Um, and I absolutely loved it. So much so, quite often after these tastings, I will only try a little bit. I'm a bit of a hoarder and I'll keep stuff back because you never know when it's going to come in handy, which is probably why I have the world's most ridiculous collection of booze. Um, lots of it in little half sample bottles where I've drunk half of it. But I finished it. And I, I, yeah, and I, that's kind of, it's not unheard of, but it's pretty rare. And the fact that I just didn't want the rest of them, I just wanted to drink that. And that's all I wanted to drink. And we were really lucky to have, I mean, it's a 50 year old, we were really lucky to have it, but it was just stunning. And um, I'm gonna have to work my way through all of their whiskies now to see which ones I really like and if my budget will allow me to have the 50 year old. That's amazing. I mean, tell, that's good. Well, to have something that old, especially I think, but I, I've not done this. I've done it once live, but obviously there was a budget involved in that, but I've not done a Desert Island Rams yet with, with Unlimited, but I think something heavy, something light, something old, it's probably a very, very good basis to work off if I ever do actually have to sit down and work this out. But fortunately, at the minute, I don't. Because um, <laughs> I think it would generally be too difficult. And I'd be tempted to put Gordon's gin in there, to be honest, because there's always quite literally a bottle within arm's reach of me. Um, but uh, look, like, I'd be lovely to catch up. I think we decided before this, is, it's been about six years since we, uh, we caught up properly. So absolute pleasure. Uh, and thanks for that. I appreciate all the insight on those things. And um, look, if anyone hasn't had a look at gin fuel blue stocking obviously it's booze related but there are many other things so it kind of pan interests please go and have a look at it and give charlie we follow because it is very very good writing but apart from that Charlie, lovely to see you and uh, sanjava you too and thank you